ladies and gentlemen good morning it is always a pleasure to speak in front of a military audience uh, the reason is very simple and personal i wanted to join the military but my eyesight uh, uh, prevented me from appearing in front of a medical board so in spite of uh, great hopes of becoming a bangladeshi uh, general bradley unfortunately i became a professor so whenever army people invite me i'm always happy to come and speak so I'll be speaking today on why soft power matters more than ever. Uh, the context has already been set. Uh, numerous scholars and uh, teachers after me, they will come and they will be speaking on soft power issues. Uh, the responsibility as far as I see is just to lay the groundwork so that we can have a good idea about uh, uh, what soft power is all about and then we can proceed and we can discuss all these issues. Uh, just a clarification, uh, soft power is something which we seem to be uh, talking about only today. In fact, that is not the case. Soft power has been around for a long, long, long time. And as a uh, great historian, Fernand Braudel showed us that Spain emerged as a center of civilizational diffusion in the 17th century, with elite groups in France fully embracing Spain function, uh, fashion and generally Cervantes novels in particular. So soft power is not a new thing, ladies and gentlemen. It has been packaged in a new way. It has always been there. Uh, the objective is now to understand it. So the concept, as um, everyone has been discussing and will be discussing in the days ahead, it was introduced by Joseph Nye uh, in the early 1990s. Uh, three seminal books, Bound to Lead, published in 1990, The Paradox of American Power, 2002, and Soft Power, 2004. Uh, this is where he has discussed the concept of soft power uh, and its nuances. Uh, again, the context is very important. It all began in the 1990s when declinist theories had the strength and popularity in mainstream IR theories, uh, particularly in the United States. This was a big thing. People were talking about the decline of the United States. Uh, 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 Kennedy writes his famous book on how, why great powers fail. So decline and uh, sense of doom and gloom, this was prevailing in the air at that time. Nye wrote his first book at that particular juncture. Uh, he criticized the declinist theories, and in the process, he first articulated the concept of soft power. Uh, soft power's definition is very simple, according to Knight. It's the ability to make others want what you want. So immediately, you make a counter-distinction. Uh, soft power is the opposite of hard power. The ability, and hard power is, of course, the ability to make others do what you want. So ladies and gentlemen, the subtle difference, to make others want what you want and to make others do what you want. So this is the big difference between soft power and hard power. Soft power, or co-optive power, which our indirect power, as Nye calls it, rests on the attraction of set of ideas uh, exerts uh, or on the capacity to set political agendas that shape the presence of others related to intangible elements like culture, ideologies, and institutions. The Honorable Secretary pointed out this morning that uh, uh, culture, uh, institutions, uh, ideologies, they matter. And of course, this is something which Nai did talk about. He continued to write prolifically. Uh, you know the old saying, uh, you publish or you perish in the academic world. So he continued writing. In 2002, he revisits the theme of soft power in his book, The Paradox of American Power. And in the change context, again, the situation has changed. Now, Nye was looking at a different America, an America where there were two types of people, isolationist and triumphalist. Isolationist, a group of people who were saying that we no longer want to stay engaged with the world. And then there was another group of people who thought that of the American exceptionalism and that America is a country where they do the difficult today and the impossible tomorrow, and hence we can deal with this world. So Nye was confronting this group of people, and he came up with a new idea or a new definition as far as soft power is concerned. So he said that it is a complex three-dimensional chess game where you have the military, you have economic, and where you have transnational um, level, where a diversity of state and non-state actors coexist, and the debate over polarities is, is meaningless. Uh, if hard power can be effective in military and economic spheres, soft power can only work at the transnational level. And of course, um, Nye kept on working on this. His, his classic book again came out in 2004, which is Soft Power, which is entirely devoted to the theoretical development of the concept and its implications. So let us see what it is all about. Why does soft power matter? The uh, focus of today's lecture, um, as far as the Sri Lankan army has given me the responsibility. Soft power matters for three important reasons. Uh, number one, the appearance of nuclear weapons and the horror of using them made states rethink and the use of military power in current international relations. This is a post-1945 phenomenon. 
uh, when the first atomic bomb was, uh, was uh, detonated, uh, Oppenheimer, the inventor of the atomic bomb, quoted the Gita where he said, I have become death, the destroyer of worlds. And it is this fear which has haunted mankind since 1945. So nuclear weapons, even though they are there, the genie is out of the bottle, but uh, it is something which has prevented military thinkers to use nuclear weapons even though there were threats. So this is where, again, the concept of soft power comes up. The idea of physically occupying a country and ruling over it seems more difficult than ever. We have seen numerous examples in recent times, um, Afghanistan being a classic example. And as the old Afghan proverb says, it is not difficult to conquer Afghanistan. It is difficult to hold on to it. And I think numerous powers have learned that uh, both in the past and in recent uh, times. So it is tough to fight uh, coercive inter intervention and trade sanctions, but harder still to prevent the spread of, uh, sorry, uh, just gone back. So in terms of economic and cultural means of achieving a, what a country seems to want is more effective and viable than uh, coercive actions. The second reason why uh, soft power matters to it is, of course, uh, the increase in higher education. In higher education is something which has exploded all over the world, and I think uh, our next speakers will talk about this. Uh, and of course, couple that with democratization movement in different parts of the world, you now have a domestic educated audience which often pressurizes leadership to conform to global international norms. So soft power suddenly becomes very important. And the third issue is, of course, which uh, Professor Adrian has already pointed out, the issue of information uh, revolution. Uh, information and revolution uh, and knowledge undoubtedly flow more easily and quickly than guns, and people's way of thinking and acting are ultimately influenced by uh, information and knowledge to which they have access. It is tough to fight coercive intervention and trade sanctions, but harder still, ladies and gentlemen, to prevent the spread and penetration of public information. And of course, television and the internet, they have become the big thing. So you know the names, uh, BBC, CNN, Al Jazeera, CCTV. Uh, these are the big boys as far as the global media order is concerned. But then again, there's a question of fairness, uh, which is something which may be discussed uh, later. The world appears to be flat um, rather than a hierarchical bureaucracy where social organization has been forced to adapt to the flat situation which makes the use of penetrating soft power easier than physical hard power. These are the three traditional ways where soft power is used these days. We tend to think about soft power along these three lines. But I will try to make things a bit more complicated and throw some other ideas at you so that you can think about soft power in a different way. Joseph Nye con uh, concentrates on the positive aspects of soft power, but soft power can also be used in a negative way, and this is something which I want to highlight. It can be used in domestic policy more than in foreign affairs. Soft power dis discourse is a useful uh, device for understanding how policymakers and public intellectuals in different countries are actively cons uh, constructing the image of country X and a world to promote their ideological projects. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, soft power is primarily an issue of domestic politics, um, determining a country's future direction, and only secondarily about international politics. While such discussions of soft power certainly seem to, uh, seek to build favor among foreign audiences, they're also concerned with the identity slash security issues of safeguarding regime legitimacy at home. So what does it mean? It means a dual approach. It means the positive emo image of a benevolent country that embraces the outside world. Identity and security are linked in the negative process, so this is the second phase, of drawing symbolic borders between self and the other. So rather than a set of stable essential values, civilization here is best understood uh, a contingent discourse that takes shape in relation to the, its opposite, that is barbarism. So as political theorist uh, Walter Benjamin pointed out in 1964, there is no civilization which is not at the same time a document to barbarism. In this contingent, self, other relations, whenever we declare something to be civilized, we are simultaneously declaring something to be uh, barbaric. So domestic politics, in other words, is tied up to foreign relations through this distinction. A positive civilized inside takes shape only when it is distinguished from a negative outside. So various countries, current identity security dynamics operate in such, manner, in, in such ways through negative soft power. The self is defined as civilized through the deliberate creation and exclusion of others as barbarians. So this is a process which is not the monopoly of a single country, ladies and gentlemen, but I think 
think all civilizations across the world more or less follow it. So whether it is the Chinese or the Russians or even the Bangladeshi way of looking at the world, so we imagine ourselves and at the same time we imagine others, whether it is United States, or Japan, India, Pakistan, the West and so on. Regime legitimacy is again another very important issue. So this is another use of soft power which we needs to be taken into consideration. Soft power is relevant to the enhancement of regime legitimacy. The international increase in the positive attraction that is associated with the rise of soft power makes it easier for regimes to convince its citizens of a rise in status, which again plays to the domestic audience. So evidence of an increase in international recognition and attraction could be used to bolster the claim that regime has successfully improved the country's international image. This helps to bring cohesion within the country, to make the country homogeneous. And again, this is something which I want you to um, seriously ponder. So this helps the cohesion between political, social, and cultural core of polity and those on the margins. So Nye's claim that soft power is based on attractiveness and seduction, foreign policy decision making, so ladies and gentlemen, we are not looking at the difficulties of soft power. Soft power gives us the idea that it is all about attracting people, seducing people in other words. But foreign policy decision making, we should be careful about this, is mediated uh, by domestic political institutions and bureaucracies and filtered through the prism of national interest. There is little evidence that states or policymakers who act in the names of states make decisions because they like another state or its leaders. The classic example of this is Woodrow Wilson coming to Europe after 1919. A rapturous welcome from the Europeans. But George Clemenceau and Lloyd George made sure that France's and Britain's interests were well protected at Versailles. Uh, so this is again something we should be careful about when we tend to get too carried away uh, with the concept of soft power. So even if one accepts that soft power exists, um, one can and can affect state's relation. It is hard to trace the relationship between soft power and policy outcomes. So questions automatically come up. Uh, did the Soviet Union collapse because of soft power or was it something else? Uh, who won the Cold War? Was it soft power? And another important question, today armies often tend to look at soft power and United Nations peacekeeping. My question to all of you is this. Is it really soft power which is working as far as UN peacekeeping is concerned? We are now talking about robust peacekeeping. We are now talking about operations in Mali, for example, or in difficult terrains of the world where you have to put boots on the ground, where blood has to be shed and treasury depleted. So is this really soft power? So definitional problem persists. So there is an intellectual black hole as far as soft power is concerned. Uh, it seems to include everything, uh, foreign aid, development assistance, the provision of international public goods, the exportation of democracy, nation building. So in other words, it also includes the kitchen sink, that is military power. Soft power seems to mean everything these days, and we should be careful about this. There is a methodological problem as far as soft power is concerned. But then again, trust the intellectuals, they have to make a living. So what they do is, like marketing mavens, they came up with a new concept as far as soft power is concerned. So we meet them and we create something different. So we have introduced a smarter version, um, soft power two. Soft power uh, in this particular case marries hard power and it leads to a new concept which is called smart power. But remember ladies and gentlemen, Nye's original definition of soft power focused on the attractive power of a state's culture and values and explicitly stated that soft power excludes both coercion and inducement. And here is the problem as far as soft power is concerned, the paradox of soft power. Soft power has never existed in a pristine form, not even in the heyday of US, uh, USA's post-World War II hegemony. And this is the problem with hegemonic powers. Uh, it both entices and it repels. So that is why many analysts, including uh, soft power analysts, which includes Joseph Nye, and skeptics, uh, they have identified that there is a close relationship between soft power and hard power. And I end with the wise words of a very famous American president who himself uh, took part both in soft power and hard power activities. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt has the last word when he says that maybe it is better to speak softly and carry a big stick. You will go far. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.